today is by Alexander Madre uh, from EPFL, and uh, he'll be here on and off, I guess, over the semester to answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he'll talk on electric flows, optimization, and a new approach to max flow problem. Yeah, uh, thanks, Gary, for the introduction, and thanks for inviting me here. It's really a very pleasant workshop. I learned a lot still about the, about the area. So yeah, the title of my talk is pretty lengthy, but it is for a reason, because sort of the goal of this series of these three lectures is to tie together a bunch of different concepts. So essentially, the idea would be to tie most of the things that we have heard about in the previous talks, and most prominently the electrical flows and the notion of electrical flows, with some uh, core concepts in optimization, and sort of apply this to well, this to a set of tools to a particular problem in graph algorithms, namely the maximum flow problem. But you know, even though there is the maximum flow problem in the title, you shouldn't take it too literally. Like this is just meant as an example of a broader deal that I think is at play here, or just like trying to get new tools for graph algorithms. Okay, so we will focus on maximum flow, but you know, it's not only about maximum flow. Okay. So sort of the point of start here is, you know, one way of viewing spectral graph theory, or at least this classical spectral uh, graph theory that I guess Luca to, uh, the, well, talked mostly about, is namely we are trying, so what we are trying to do here, we are trying to understand our graph, its commutator structure, via st studying eigenvalues and eigenvectors of certain associated uh, matrices, most prominently, of course, the Laplacian matrix. Okay? So, so this is, you know, this is a great success story that had many, many successes, and again, Lucas talk uh, highlighted some of them. But I would argue that you know, we are slowly getting past that. And so, so there is sort of the next generation of spectral graph theory uh, appearing. I would call it linear algebraic graph theory, even though probably there is a better name. I just don't know what it is. And somehow, what we are trying to do here is just we try to not only look at eigenvalues or eigenvectors, we are just trying to use some linear algebraic objects to understand graph better and manipulate it better. Okay? And somehow, the central object, I would argue here, is the notion of electric graph flows, in particular the fact that that's what uh, John talked about, is that we can compute the graph flows <coughs> extremely fast. Okay? Sort of the goal of this lecture is just to try to show to you how you can incorporate this primitive or uh, electric graph flows into, you know, into something that can be used in algorithmic graph theory at large. So as an so, so efficient tool for solving graph problems. Okay? But so those, those linear algebraic objects, they are most still, I mean, they are coming from the spectral basis. Yes, uh, I knew that someone would ask that, and I was suspecting that it would be you. Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's true, but you know, like, the point is that most of the times when we talk about classical spectral graph theory, we look at one eigenvalue, maybe you know, first k eigenvalues for a small value of k. Here we really want to look at the whole spectrum. And the nice thing about the graph flow is that it sort of gets access to this whole wealth of information in one shot. Right? For the sake of the program and its title, maybe you can just uh, enlarge the umbrella instead of creating a new umbrella. That's an interesting debate that we can should have offline. And actually, uh, we're talking with Dan Spearman about that. And I think he's with me on that. Well, we'll see if he's there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. <laughs> so you know, it, it is approved by authority, I guess. And, um, so uh, you know, it's a good thing. And I'm not sure what is the uh, uh, what is the the right uh, what is the right uh, what is the right name here. But I just want to highlight that there is some qualitative difference here. That we are just using a different type of objects and we are accessing them in different ways. Okay. Uh, so, so this is the plan, and essentially, as I said already, our focus will be the maximum flow problem. I actually, there will be small, maybe not so small, interlude today about yet another problem, namely the random spanning tree generation, and this is mostly for diversity. I just wanted to show this DM showing up in more than one scenario, and random spanning tree generation is like what's happening there is simple enough that I can actually squeeze it in into the lecture and, you know, and say something about that. Okay? So this will be our focus. But again, it's not about the examples, it's about the theme that, is, uh, that shows up here. And I mean, the underlying theme here is that we are trying to mesh commuter and continuous methods. Okay? So roughly speaking, sort of very high level goal here is something that also John already mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, in, in his talk, is that you know, we want to look at this body of work on graph algorithms in the, that is sort of very combinatorial in nature. So we talk about trees, paths, partitions, and so on. And then we want to tie these objects to some linear algebraic tools, yes, like eigenvalues, algebraic flows in your systems. And then what we want to do is we want to use a complex optimization primitives as an intermediary that allows us to turn this understanding and this connection into actual fast algorithms. Okay? So, so this will be the underlying theme. And again, this is a part of a broader agenda than just solving max flow. Okay? This is really, I think there is something, uh, you know, 
something more interesting happening than, than, than just that. Okay? So this is just this is just the high level overview. And maybe let's just start to be a bit more concrete. So let's just start by actually defining what the maximum flow problem is. So in this problem, we are given a directed graph G with integer capacities on Rs, and we have two special vertices, source S and C. Okay? And essentially, you know, if you find it, if it might be easier, you can think of Rs as rows. So this is a road network. Capacities correspond to the number of, of lanes, and S and T are the original digit destination. Okay? And roughly the question is. To, well, is to find a feasible ST flow of maximum value, which in this analogy translates to we want to estimate the maximum rate of, rate of traffic from SOT that this road network can, uh, can sustain. Okay? So roughly speaking, uh, <coughs> what is a feasible ST flow? So a feasible ST flow is any assignment of numbers to arcs that satisfies two types of constraints. Okay? So one, one, one type of constraints are the flow conservation constraints. What they just tell us is that there is no leaks at vertices other than SMT. Okay, so whatever is the traffic is coming in, it should come out. That's a very healthy constraint. And you know, the other uh, type of constraint is the capacity constraint. And what just it says is that you know, there's no overflow on arcs, meaning we can't assign the, uh, the more flow to it than its capacity. Okay? So any assignment of numbers to arcs that satisfies this, uh, satisfies this, uh, uh, this type of constraint is a feasible to flow. And now what we want to maximize is we want to maximize the value, which is just the net flow out of S, which by flow conservation constraints is equal to the net flow into, into T. Okay? So here on this example, we have a flow of value 7. But the actual max flow, uh, max flow value of this graph is 10. And you know, here is an example of a flow that just attains this value. Okay? So this is the problem. And the <coughs> usual question is you know, why this is an interesting sport to study. Okay? Why do we care about this problem? And you know, the blanket answer is that this is a fundamental optimization problem. And again, there are some good reasons to, uh, to well, call it such. So it's actually so we have one reason for uh, one reason for, for the fact that it's a fundamental is just you know the proof by induction. So it was studied, you know, in started, studied, started to be studied in 1930s, and since then there were many papers on this. So clearly it has to be important because you know, there will not be no, no this paper about that. Uh, but also, you know, the reason why it was started to be studied so early on is that it actually has a surprisingly diverse array of applications. Okay, so of course, just for the explanation I just I gave you, it's clear what are the applications of transportation. But the real power and, in, and the reason why this problem is so interesting is that there are non-trivial connections to many other areas where this problem turns out to be the core uh, optimization primitive that has to be solved. Okay, so. This is one reason to, to care about this problem, but the reason why I care about this problem is that actually from the theoretical <coughs> point of view, this was a very influential problem in development of graph algorithms in particular, but algorithms in general. So there are many very, uh, very fundamental techniques that were first developed to tackle this problem, and later on people realized that this is a marginal technique that can be a private problem. Okay, so sort of the Maxwell problem, if you look at the history of this problem, it has very like it's a great hour of sort of initiating this kind of new techniques and new approaches. Okay. So that's why I like it. Okay, so what is known about max flow? So as you can imagine, given the history of the problem, there is a lot of previous work, and I will not even try to go over, over it. There is a whole book, very thick book, that, uh, just, that just essentially contains results on the max flow problem. And what I just want to do, I just want to do a very rough history outline, sort of just roughly what was happening. And sort of the you know the pioneering works here from the point of view of analysis of algorithms here is the, are the works of Danzig and the Port Fulkerson that essentially gave the first algorithms for this problem. The one issue with this algorithm is that there is a dependence on U, which is the maximum capacity of the graph. And you know, since they depend linearly on U, they are not really polynomial in our understanding of the sense because we just need log n uh, well, log U bits to specify a, a and the capacity of size u, so these are not they are not polynomial in the size of the input, but they were really the first algorithms for the problem, and they actually had very important uh, uh, conceptual contribution that somehow we will we'll see showing up later, and in particular they were the basis for the follow-up work. Okay, so the next sort of important uh, important step here was the work of Diniz and Edmond Scarp, who actually showed the first polynomial algorithms for the problem. Okay, so they actually showed that you can solve this problem in polynomial time. In fact, it's even better than that because they are strongly polynomial. So they, in particular, they don't depend on the capacities of the group. Okay. And you know, later on, there was a sort of. What so we, you, uh, just um, technical question. You're counting here arithmetic operations in all of these. Yes, I'm counting arithmetic operations. Yes, of course. Okay. 
So, uh, so uh, later on there was some improvement in running time again. The, log, the dependence on u came back again, but all, now it's in acceptable form. It's just logarithmic on u. And essentially, you know, by the year, I guess, 85. <coughs> so by the way, you notice there's always, there are always two discoverers for each of the bound. And the reason for that is that this was during the Cold War. So, you know, so one half of the, of the discoverers are from Russia. The other one is from, uh, from, uh, from the US, I guess, mainly. And then I say that I always find it amazing, you know, how they manage to somehow always discover it roughly at the same time. That's a, a similar concept. So this really, I, I always find it really, really amazing. No, because it shows that there is something, something beautiful and really like fundamentally like, hidden. Like, people discover it. <laughs> <laughs> this is called zeitgeist. Sorry. This is called zeitgeist. Okay, so essentially by the by the year 85, uh, 85, you know, the sort of the, the, the best running time known was of uh, of a man, and to many people, I think they were believing that this might be the right answer, because you know the, this O of a man bound hits something called flow decomposition bound, and I will not explain uh, to you what it is if, 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 if you don't know already. Or just there was some heuristic reason why you might try to argue that this is the right bound, but then there was a breakthrough by Goldberg Rao, which lost a G here, but sorry for that and uh, So what back row, which essentially well, uh, gave a running time, which is the minimum of these two terms, which is the minimum of the n to the three halves and n times n to thirds. And you know, the point, one of the important implications of that is that actually you know, this breaks this MN binary. And this was quite a surprise at that time. Okay? And okay. So this is, uh, well, this is roughly where the things stand. But you know, what I want to do in this talk, I want to actually focus on a particular regime of uh, the maximum flow question. Namely, I want to focus on the regime when we, have, when we deal with sparse graphs. So we assume that the number of arcs is not much larger than the number of vertices. And also, I will assume that uh, the capacities are one. Okay? So one reason why I might want to do this is that this just, just will make our whole discussion a bit more focused. But actually, there's even more than that. So in a sense, if you look again at the history of the problem, then this regime of sparse unit capacity graphs was always the one in which we had first improvement on the problem. Okay? And only later on, once we had improvement in this, in this regime, the uh, development for more general settings uh, broke. Okay? So somehow, this seems, if we, uh, this seems to be really the benchmark of how well we understand the problem. And also, or even in this restricted setting, it, uh, this maximum flow problem already captures some interesting uh, <coughs> problems, in particular, bar pattern matching, maximum capacity bar pattern matching already is captured in this regime. Okay? So this is, uh, this is the regime we will work with. And once we apply this kind of filter to the previous result, we will see that essentially the work of goldberg Rao, uh, well, it, it provides an algorithm that runs in time and to the three halves. And you know, essentially, you know, the barrier is that like, this is the best that we know, essentially. And you, know, you can view it as a sort of, sort of, well, some kind of barrier. Like, this is a barrier which is even more striking because the bound of n to the three halves for the case of sparse unit capacity graphs was already achieved, I guess, at this point it would be 40 years ago, okay, that by work of even Taj and Karzanov. So essentially, we knew the, for this restricted setting, we knew this n to the three halves algorithm for a long time. But you know, the only thing that happens in the last 40 years is just you know, we, managed to uh, we managed to match this bound for increasingly more general settings, but you know, no improvement on this, you know, on this, on this bound. Okay, this was the uh, well, this was the best we could do. And clearly, you know, if you think about it, you know, this is not definitely like we, we are stuck here not for lack of trying. There is some fundamental uh, limitations of our technique that we couldn't uh, that we couldn't uh, overcome. And essentially, you know, what I want to tell you during the course of these three lectures is a new approach to the problem that actually finally breaks this bound. Okay. And again, you know, the point is not that we will be breaking this bound. The point is that we will introduce a new approach, and somehow breaking this bound is just a certificate that this is something genuinely new, that genuinely new that we have not seen before. Alex, for uh, the right time m times n, so there is a kind of concrete barrier, which is the flow decomposition yes. barrier. For n to the one point five, there is also some heuristic reason, like you can say, there is a class of there is a there is a heuristic uh, heuristic reason. It's a bit more technical, like it's not as concrete, but yeah, it roughly actually goes back to the ball growing argument. Like essentially, one way of thinking is okay. So one, one way of thinking is that just the ball growing argument is tight, and the other thing is just you know you you just want to yeah like okay let's leave it just at that. I'm happy to go more over in offline, but there is yes there is a very concrete argument that shows up in all the work 
and it gives you n to the three halves, and somehow we couldn't get it better uh, for this first class Okay? Another question? <coughs> The product of the cut and the flow, right? Yes, but this is also a build build -over. It's like if you have something at distance and square root of n, then there has to be a good cut, right? <coughs> yeah. uh, okay. So this is this is sort of our goal, and let's just let uh, us talk a little bit about you know how this this barrier was uh, was broken. And somehow the point of start here is that usually when you approach some, some, some barrier, you know, how would you go about it? Well, think about maybe an easier problem and try to make some progress there. Okay? So the easier pro uh, problem here is just this, the setting in which we have an undirected graph. And actually, we even don't care uh, about solving the problem exactly. We even don't care about solving the problem approximately. We just want you to be able to approximately tell us what is the right value of flow. Okay? So we don't even ask you to provide us the flow. Just tell us, you know, what is the answer roughly? What is the value of the max flow in a given graph? And even for this setting, this n to the three has barrier is uh, what was holding. And the question is, you know, can we do something here? And well, indeed, as to, as a f uh, as a first indication, there was a technique that al actually allows you to get uh, uh, well allows you uh, uh, to get a, a approximate very good approximation, like roughly polylog uh, polylog approximation in times close to mean linear. So again. Poly log approximation to the value of max flow is not too is not too hot. Like this is not something really that the breakthrough. But at least you know there is some small there is some small uh, you know, small hole into which you can try to like pursue and get something something more. And indeed, uh, a bit later, this is the well, this is the result joined with uh, with Paul Cristiano, John Kellner, and uh, uh, Dan Spielman and Shane Quateng. It showed that actually when you care about the proper approximation, so actually you care about one minus epsilon approximation in undirected graphs, then something can be done. And you can actually get an n to the four thirds algorithm. Okay, so again, the number is important. It's important that, that this is smaller than n to the three halves. And actually, in a very beautiful and stunning uh, line of work, this, you know, this, essentially these two algorithms and the ideas behind them, plus, plus some uh, other brilliant ideas, led to you know, the best that we can hope for in this regime. Then we can get a one minus epsilon approximation to max flow in undirected graph in close to linear time. Okay? So in this sort of setting of undirected and approximate, we are done and actually we we are performing better than expected. And you know, everything is essentially done here. Okay? So that's great, but of course, you know, that's only the under undirected and approximate setting. So you know, so what about the directed case? Well it turns out that actually something better can be done here. It is only like so. As I said, we are working here only in unit capacity uh, regime. So this, all these results work for unit capacity regime, re regime, although everything here generalizes immediately to non-unit capacities, but this doesn't. Okay? This is really a result only for unit capacities. Okay? And somehow, my plan, uh, my plan for, this, for, uh, well, for this lecture is that you know, I will talk about other things for the, well, I will just give you a flavor of what are the techniques behind these two results that, uh, that sort of that matter. But I will go a bit more in depth into them in each of the separate lectures. And sort of the reason why I'm covering this, uh, this result as opposed to this result in here is not because this is my result, but actually because the tools that come into play here, they show up here again. And somehow this will be easier to see where the, where the motivation for these techniques come from uh, once we see the other. OK? So are there any questions at this point? So let us uh, uh, well let us talk about you know how can we how can we solve a flow faster and usually you know when we when we uh, well try to introduce a new approach it's a good it's, it's a good thing to spend some time and look at the previous approach and see what's happening okay so the previous approach that probably all of you know is the at least if you want to get asymptotically best algorithms is so-called augmenting path framework which was developed all the way back in uh, in the in fifties by Fortin Fulkerson okay. So what's happening there? Well, the basic idea is just we want to solve max flow by repeatedly finding st paths in the residual algorithm. Okay. So what does this really mean? So in the unit capacity case, uh, case this framework becomes extremely simple. And essentially, what we are doing, we are just playing the following game, in which you know in each iteration we want just to find some st path. It doesn't have to be short path, just any st path in, the, in our current graph. And now, once we found an st path, we indicate that we found it by just flipping the direction of all the edges in our graph and taking this new graph as our residual graph. And now we have a residual graph, which is was updated, and we just 
look for another path, a SD path in it again. And, you know, and we just once we find the path, we flip the edges out of this path. And somehow we can flip some of the edges back. That's completely fine. And essentially, what is not hard to see is that you know, if we play this game long enough, long enough meaning until there is no more SD path that you can find, then essentially just taking the flip edges and sending a, 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 sending a unit flow over them will give us the max flow of the graph. OK? So, so this, is, you know, this is the general framework. This is the general idea. And you can, as you can see, you know, it has many advantages. First of all, it's just beautiful and simple. Okay. Also, it's purely combinatorial. Everything happens by just augmenting the flow along the paths. Nothing fancy is happening in really. And also, it's greedy, which so it's something that we like. It's like we like greedy approaches, at least as long as they work. Okay. And this is definitely a greedy approach. Okay. But of course, there are some problems, and one of the key problems with that is that it's very difficult to analyze this kind of algorithms. In particular. It's quite easy to see that this algorithm for unit capacity case gives, gives an n squared algorithm. All you have to notice is that finding each path takes roughly O of n time, and the value of max flow can be at most n, so you, can, you just need to find at most uh, n augmenting path. So this gives you n squared. But to go beyond that is actually much harder, and you know, just the more sophisticated implementation and more sophisticated argument, which is due again to even Tajan and Kazanov, gives you n to the three halves. Okay? But you really have to work on it. Okay? Especially on the data structure part. Uh, and data, the data structure uh, data side. Okay? So you know, so this is the, essentially the state of the art in this framework, like n two three halves is the best that we can do, and you know, it's really unclear how to go beyond this n two three halves. Yeah? And again, like this barrier that I told you about is exactly hidden in this argument here. Right? Essentially all like all it just says is if I have two vertices that are you know the shortest distance is square root of n roughly, you know, it's what is the best cut that I can prove its existence of, uh, in this graph. So if the graph has all of n edges, then you can show that at least one of the cuts has to have sides of the whole square root of n, but that's the best you can do in the worst case. And so well, this is the value when you, when, when you get n to the So this is the argument that you have to go big. OK? So this is the previous approach. And of course, now the question is, you know, how can, if we can't make progress in, within this approach, so how, you know, how to go about something different, so how to go beyond how to do that. And some of the idea is, well, I already said it, is just to bring linear algebraic techniques into the plane. Okay? So what we want to do is we want to probe the global flow structure of the graph by solving linear systems. And you know, the obvious question here, even though probably they're not so striking and not so puzzling now once you have seen John Stock and other folks, is you know, how to relate something as combinatorial as the flow structure to something you know, as linear algebraic as solving linear system. And more importantly, why would you on Earth want to do that? Right? Like why would this even this a good thing to do? And of course, there is a good answer to that. And this good answer corresponds to the notion of algebraic flow. Right? So well, this is the key notion that spans these two combinatorial and uh, linear algebraic flows <coughs> together here. Okay? So let me take a moment to define algebraic flows, even though probably by this time you already are sick of it. Uh, but just you know, maybe some of you just came for this lecture. Uh, well, probably improbable, like it's improbable, but maybe it can happen. So just for this one person in the room. Uh, let me just uh, define electrical flows again. I will do it quickly. So again, <coughs> electrical flow. Well, what is nice about them is that they show up in many scenarios. So also because of that, they have many uh, many equivalent definitions. So one of them just says the, what is our main intuition is that if I have an undirected graph G and resistance is assigned to uh, to edges and sources and CT, and notice that here the graph is undirected, even though in max flow I allow the graph to be directed, here is undirected. The well, the way I get electrical flow is just I treat uh, I treat uh, edges as a resistance of corresponding resistance, and then I just connect the battery to S and T and look at the current that surface in this, in this, in the circuit. Okay, and so whatever I get, well, that's electrical. So this is a purely physical uh, definition. A bit better definition, and more mathematically amendable, is the definition just by that sort of also John <coughs> in his last talk. And I mean, what it just says is that one way of viewing what electrical flow is is just this. This is the unique flow. A well, ST flow, a, a feasible ST or a valid ST flow of prescribed value f that is induced by potentials via ohms. Okay, so essentially, the electrical flow has this unique property that you know there exists there exists vertex potential that will that, that will uh, induce it via ohms law, and yeah, and as already John said, one way of thinking about finding electrical flow is just to find the vertex potentials that induce it. So whenever we find the vertex potentials that induce a, a valid ST flow, so a flow that has a deficit of F as S 
a surplus of f at t and no leads uh, anywhere else, this will be integral flow by definition. No, so, so questions? Say at this level, why you would not be daunted by that and say, look, this is not going to go anywhere once we get to directed crowds, and so why should we listen? Well, I have that such a point in my third lecture, but uh, yes, uh, let me you ask your money for this lecture. Yes, exactly, yes. Like, you know, no one will come to my third lectures if I give all the puns by that. But sort of, uh, well, uh, okay, so there are two answers to that. So one answer is uh, very specific to Maxwell's question, and what you can show is that actually, when you, like Maxwell has a very curious property that you know, solving exact max flow in directed graph can be reduced to solving exact max flow in undirected graph. So it's really not about graph being undirected or directed, it's really about getting sufficient accuracy. So that's one answer. The second answer is a little bit, and again, this will show up in the, in the third talk, is essentially, yes, you know, if you, have a, if you are trying to solve a directed question, then yes, of course, the graph is directed and, you know, and your electrical flows are not. But somehow, what you probably will do, you will, you will want to have some improvement steps, yes? So you have some kind of solution, and you would like to improve it somehow. And yes, and again, you can throw more in one direction than the other, but locally, you know, if you are considering small enough step, things are, things are undirected in both senses. Essentially, you have some residual capacities in both directions, and they are non-zero, okay? You, you ensure that they are non-zero. And then somehow, in this local neighborhood, you know, it doesn't matter which direction uh, your improvement step uh, uh, routes, the, uh, routes the flow. It's still okay. So like globally, it's a directed problem, but locally, it's a undirected problem. And that's what you are using. And actually, that's what will be happening in the third lecture when we will be solving the problem. You to have an improvement procedure that, of course, maintains a directed flow. But whenever it makes improvement, it sort of assumes, like, it takes small enough neighborhood, then in this neighborhood, you can assume this undirected flow, and then you will use electrical flow to make improvement. Okay, so there are two And right. the other one is more general than the first one. But until, until your paper, you're the only one who believed that it would work, right? <laughs> but I know that you didn't work. You didn't believe it. But I'm not sure I was the only one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a, it was in Spielman and Dave, right? Yeah, so, so like, that's what I'm saying. I know that James was a big skeptic, but that's not surprising. <laughs> so you, you, uh, in, in, at least in the slide, you didn't state any relation between the R and the flow that because, well, we will discover what it will be. For now, it's just, I, I'm just defining an uh, electrical flow for okay. some parameters of R, and then we will see what the parameter will become. And again, we will see it in the second lecture. So you see, that's my only way of securing that you will show up to my other lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make, yeah. make clear, uh, your aim is to find the value of the maximum flow, not to not actually produce the maximum. Oh no, now I want to produce even maximum flow. So I, only, I will both know the value and I will produce the flow. That, uh, <coughs> And you can produce the flow also in direct Yes. Yeah, it's exactly it's even integral. Provided the capacities are one and provided the capacities are one, yes. So okay. so as long as the capacities are one, I can give you an exact integral even flow. Okay. So this is the second definition. And now the third definition is actually the one that we really this is the way we should think about the problem well, in, when we are listening to these lectures. <coughs> Namely, it views electrical flow as a result of several optimization problem. Okay, so essentially what, what this optimization is, is just we are trying to look over the space of all flows of value f in our graph. And we try to choose the one that minimizes the energy, which energy is just the sum over all the edges, the distance of the edge times flow of the edge squared. Okay, so it's really like the, the right view to view electrical flows in this talk is to see them as you know, L2 minimization over the space of flow. Okay, and this is really the, the key way to think about it in, in, in the rest of the talk. But again, all these three definitions are equivalent and can be proven, but you know, this, is that, this is the facet of it that we really want to uh, we want to. Use. Okay, so uh, you know, so now we know what electrical flows are, but of course we want to have fast algorithms. So you know, how to compute electrical flows? And well, clearly, if you if you if you went to the previous lectures, you know what you have to do. Well, all you have to do is solve a linear system, and it's not even linear system, but it's a Laplacian linear system. And you know, once you know that then we can just uh, refer to the previous talk by John, and you know that you can compute electrical flow extremely fast, maybe in nearly linear time. Okay, when I say compute, it's actually doesn't it exactly, you compute it up to a very high precision, but that will be enough for all of our applications. Okay? Essentially, so from now on, we know that whenever we include, uh, to compute electrical flow, we can just do it in nearly linear time, so it's as fast as possible. And now the question is, you know, this is a clearly a huge hammer, you know, like, just think about it. What else in graph algorithms can you compute in linear time? Yes, you can do 
uh, I don't know, the VEF S, you can compute shortest path. You know, you can find the spanning tree, you know, the so like minimum spanning tree, but you know, this is all very simple procedure. And suddenly here you have something so much, at least seemingly so much more powerful and the same price tag. So you know, it's clearly there is some power here. The question is how to employ it, and not only for Maxwell, but for other problems as well. Okay. Okay. So you know, let me just uh, let me just show you how you know one scenario in which you already can use elliptical flow to, to get something for maximum flow. Control. So we'll just focus for now for, uh, on a directed static, okay? And how can we how can we do this here? And essentially, this is this is the world that I already mentioned with with all John and Dan and uh, Shang Huang, okay? So you know, if I told you here is an undated graph with capacities, or actually with comp all capacities being one. And I, here is an epsilon, and you know, can you find me in, in one mass epsilon approximate max flow in this graph? Okay, so what would you do? And I tell you that I want you to use any graph flows. What would you do? Okay. So first, notice that without loss of generality, essentially, we can assume that we know what is the optimal value of flow. Okay. So I'm saying without loss of generality because we just apply some binary search strategy, and you just can get uh, can this. So assume that we know what is the value of, of the maximum flow. And now, you know, what would you do to actually? We try to approximate it in the graph. Okay, so here is a very simplistic strategy. So what you will do, well, you will want to compute electrical flows, so probably you have to impose some resistances. Okay, so how about starting with all the resistances being one? Okay, now once I have the resistances, so well, I should compute some electrical flow, and I clearly want to compute electrical flow of the value of star, okay, because that, that should be the right flow. So I compute this electrical <coughs> flow, and what I can tell about this flow? So one nice thing about this flow is that this is actually a valid ST flow, meaning that it is satisfying flow conservation constraints. And you know, even though here we get it for free, this is something extremely important. Okay? So dealing with, you know, with, uh, with some problems with flow conservation is extremely hard and extremely painful. So the fact that we get it for free is very important. Okay? So, this, so, this, uh, so the flow conservation constraints we are getting for free. Unfortunately, you know, the other type of constraints, I mean, the, 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 the capacity constraints, they, are, they might be valid. Okay? So essentially, for instance, here we have an edge that, uh, that flows 1.5 when it should only flow at most 1. And because of that, this is not a, a maximum flow. Okay? It's actually quite far from it. And by just playing a bit with the graph, you can make this kind of overflows much, much, much bigger. Okay? Because essentially, what's happening is that electrical flow is, is, is uh, sensitive to resistance of the network affect the distance of the paths while, for instance, max flow doesn't differentiate between the paths. So if you have, I have two parallel paths, for max flow, they are all, all look the same. For electrical flow, it depends you know, what is the effective resistance of this path, okay? when it chooses how much to flow to run. Okay? And just using this discrepancy, you can fool this electrical flow to be more and more, like overflow more and more, uh, where max flow would be Okay, So that's not good. But the question is, okay, well, maybe you can do something to fix that. And again, the most simplistic way to do this is how about just increasing resistances on these overflowing edges? Okay, increasing the resistances makes the electrical flow make for electrical flow to be less desirable to, to route too much flow in because clearly this will you know whatever flow it will be now it will be more expensive energy wise to route over this edge. Okay, so once we increase these resistances, well, what can we do? We can just repeat okay the uh, the whole competition again and hope that after not too many iterations. This thing converges to something reasonable that we will be happy with. Okay, so this sounds very simplistic and essentially, you know, like, why on earth would it work? Well, the funny thing is that it actually does. Okay? And this is essentially the general outline how this algorithm works. Of course, there are some caveats. You know, there are you have to be careful how to instantiate some of the some of the some of the things that I just mentioned here. And I will talk about these caveats and how to make it actually work. In the in the second level. Okay. So for now, you know, that's all I want to say about you know Max Flow. So this is like a teaser. Again, trying everything I can to uh, to make you come to my second lecture. <coughs> and uh, so, are there any questions about that? Okay. So in the remaining time, uh, what I want to to do is actually I want to to about on the, like about second topic that also fits this dean and somehow in a different way. So Max Flow is a purely computational problem. For which we use uh, linear algebraic techniques and metrical flow, and now we want sort of to do the other way around. So essentially, we look at the duration of random spanning tree, which you can argue that is somehow a linear algebraic notion, and then show how you can go get fast algorithms for this problem by blending in some computer understanding of the class. Okay. So, uh, okay. So random spanning tree. So what are the random spanning tree? What is the problem that we want to face here? Is well, in this problem we are given an directed graph. Okay. 
And our goal is just to simply output a uniformly random spanning tree. Okay, so essentially, if uh, this is the, the TG is the set of all the spanning trees of G, okay, so here are some examples. And what you want is that you want to output a given, uh, well, given a spanning tree with probability that is one over the size of the number of all the trees. Okay, so essentially over, you just want to 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 sample a uniformly random object uh, from the set of spanning trees of the graph. Okay, and you know one thing to note is that actually, uh, okay, there should no be there should be no minus one here. Essentially, the number of spanning trees of a graph, for example, for a complete graph, it can be as high as n to the n minus two. Okay, so it can be exponential in n. So these probabilities can be extremely tiny. Okay, so that's just something to keep in mind. So you have to be very careful, you know, with uh, like how your algorithm works because it, it, like these numbers can be really, really, really small. So you know, just th that will show up in some like this consideration will be important in some case. In some case. Okay, so this is the problem. So are there any questions about the definition of the problem? Okay, so the. Obvious question, probably that some of you might be asking now is, you know, why, why this is an interesting, uh, interesting thing to do, like generating random spanning trees, and there are some answers. So, again, one of them is that this is really a fundamental probabilistic object in graph theory. Okay, it's the it subject dates back quite a while to works of Kirchhoff, and essentially there is a whole book, a very beautiful book, by Lyons and Ferris, on essentially the, in large part, is about just probably it's called probability on trees. In, in, in large part, just deals with notion of trees and graphs, and there are some beautiful connections. But also, it has actually something, uh, something of this uh, of trees has some, uh, some applications. And more importantly, again, from the point of view of me as a theorist, it has deep connections to electrical flows and the graphs actually that okay? And we will see some of that short term. And you know, just some example of, the, of these connections. In particular, there is a very nice result that shows that if you give me a graph, and you just, just take a union of two uniform spanning tree in this graph, then what you will get will be, of course, a very sparse graph. And actually, it will lower bound your <coughs> cuts up to a factor of one log n. Okay, so it's somehow taking two a union of two random spanning trees with high probability gives you a lower bounding sparsifier. So it just gives you the like it sort of it makes sure that in every cut there is sufficiently many edges. Okay, so that's that's one connection. Other connection is actually I should say okay maybe that's too early to say that. But you know, this connection to sparsification is actually much deeper than that. Uh, and already, essentially, already Nikhil said that, that uh, well, in his, uh, in his talk, he was showed the sparsification technique that corresponded to just something edges proportional to effective resistance. And as it turned out, uh, in a couple of slides, effective resistance uh, has, a very, uh, well, have, has a very complete connection to a uh, random spanning tree. So that, that's exactly why this result is showing up here as well. Okay. Another also uh, another another way another scenario in which it shows up is essentially there is a way there's an approach to approximating the asymmetric travel system problem that uh, well that is based on finding some objects called thin trees and the random spanning tree uh, the random spanning tree is the way we know like where the best construction of these objects uh, are coming from so far. Okay. And also one more uh, one more application is actually recreation. I think this is really cool. So essentially, if you if your kids are bored, you can you, know, you can entertain them by generating them infinite uh, infinite infinite uh, number of uh, maze puzzles. So you know, what you can just do, you just look at the grid, you find the random spanning tree, and this this is where the corridor go, and you know that between S and T there is always a unique path, but it's a random path, and then you can entertain them for weeks. Uh, this way. <laughs> well, I don't think that my kids will be entertained, but. Some problem. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so there is another connection that is directly related, which is the uh, Nagamochi Nimoraki algorithm for minimum cut mm -hmm. graphs, so they generate k uh, spanning trees. Yes. Essentially, the connectivity and they link the connectivity to the minimum cut. Yes, yes, but uh, as far as like they did use tree packing to uh, well, to do that, but I don't think that they use random spanning trees. No, it's not these are Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, 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 yes, this so, is a connection between spanning trees and, yes. and well, cards and flows. Yes, yes. So there is there's a, a beautiful connection. In general, you can see, you can certify connectivity of the graph by packing trees into it. And you, just, you can just show that if you have k-connected data graph, you can pack uh, at least k over two uh, uh, edge joint trees into it. And actually, you work with with data graphs, and you care about data connectivity, and you, are, and you will be processes, and the connection is actually absolutely tight, meaning 
if, if the graph has direct connectivity k, then you can pack k uh, arborescences into it. And that's it. And if and only if conditions. So that's a beautiful. But yeah, but that's, I didn't want to stretch it too much. So that's not about random spine trees. But yeah, that's a beautiful, a very fundamental thing that actually shows up in sparsify, has sparsifiers and so on and so on. So it's a very important, it's a very really important thing. Okay. So now, uh, once we know why we might care about the problem, the question is, you know, how to generate a random spine tree. Okay. So how to do that. And, you know, one, way of doing this is exactly already the stems for the work of Kirchhoff and, uh, and the connection that's called matrix theorem, which roughly says that you know, there is a very complete connection between effective resistance and, and Avedon tree, namely if for a given edge I look at the probability that this tree will be included in the random spanning tree, then this probability is exactly the effective resistance of this edge in the group. Okay? So essentially the effective resistance that we are looking, thinking at is just we assume that all the resistances are one, and essentially, so what effective resistance is, we should remember from the previous talk, is that we just look, we just, in, like for a given edge, we induce a current of one on one end, we retain a current of one on the other end, and then we look at the energy of the electrical flow that, uh, that is induced in this way. Okay? This is always a number that, that has, is at most one, let's say it's at least zero, and magically, well, not really magically, but uh, somehow it happens that uh, this probability is exactly the effective resistance of the, of the, of the, of the, corresponding, of the corresponding flow. Of okay. So once we have this connection, there is a very easy algorithm that allows us to allows us to uh, to sample a uniform spanning tree. So what we just do, we just order edges of the graph arbitrarily, and we start with t being initially empty, and then what we do, what we do, we just go over these edges one by one, and for each edge, we compute the effective resistance. Okay. And then we add this edge to the tree, to our created tree of probability given by this uh, uh, with probability given by this uh, effective resistance, and we are not adding it with the complement probability. And then once we made this decision, we just update G by well contracting uh, E i if we decided to include it in the tree, and just removing it from the graph if we decided to not include it in the tree. Okay, and we just keep doing that for all the edges, and then we all put the tree that we construct this way. Okay, so. It shouldn't be too hard to see that you know the tree that we created actually will be a tree because this is thanks to the contraction procedure. So essentially, uh, well, uh, this is not hard to see. But you know, question is why this would be? Uh, uh, well, why would it work? Well, one thing, why thing like one important thing here is that essentially by just having this operation of either contraction or removing, we are essentially conditioning. We are encoding in our graph condition, conditioning of our choices. So essentially, what is happening is that the unit at any point of time. The choosing a uniform, uh, uniformly, uh, uniform spanning tree in the remaining graph uh, well, well, corresponds to just extending our tree in a, cons in, in a conditionally consistent manner. Okay? So essentially, once you unveil all the conditional probabilities here, what you will end up is that, you know, that each edge in your tree is, is sampled, is belongs to this tree uh, uh, like exactly with the right probability. Okay? And that's essentially how you, how you show that this algorithm works. And then the other question is, you know, how about the running time? So what is the running time of this algorithm? And clearly, the bottleneck, the only non trivial thing that we are doing here is just computing the effective resistance. Okay? We have to do it in each step. But we already know, or actually, well, I guess we know, but I can also tell that there is a very nice linear, linear algebraic expression for this effective resistance, which roughly tells us that all you have to do to compute the effective resistance is just to, to compute the graph flow, okay? which corresponds to solving the Laplacian system. The only caveat here is that actually, you know, uh, we want this sampling to be exact. so. We want to have an exact solution uh, to our to our Laplace system, and remember that this, the, the solvers that were uh, discussed, these fast solvers that were discussed, they are actually only approximate. Uh, but you know, so that's that's what you would think. But then uh, Jim Prof actually he made a very simple observation, but beautiful, but sort of simple, <coughs> hand side observation that actually allows you to argue that it's okay if you just have a good enough approximation. And you don't have to get these things exactly, and still you will end up sampling the edges with exactly the, the right probability. Okay, it's a simple trick, but you know I'm happy to, to describe it offline. I will not describe it in this talk. Uh, but essentially, the resulting running time is that we have, you know, we have sort of two options, and you know one of them is just take m iterations and in each iteration use Gaussian elimination to solve our system exactly, or you know have m iteration and then in each iteration use approximate solver and and you know and uh, and, and get the answer. And the reason why I'm actually keeping this option n to the omega here, even though you know, here it seems to be, to be much worse, is that actually you can be much smarter. Like if you allow yourself to invert the matrix, okay, so if you spend this time to actually invert the matrix, then, then you can actually amortize 
the work for completing the static resistance over the, all the edges, and in the end, you just spend the running time that is just you know proportional to the to the time needed to invert the matrix. Okay, so somehow you can hide this m iteration here if you are smart. Okay, and this is the result of column and all. Okay, so essentially from this insight from this matrix T theorem, these are the running times that we that we can obtain. How does this compare with purely algorithmic or algorithmic or realistic uh, algorithms? Uh, all the randos and so Next slide. So okay, so, so 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 this is what we what we can do, and the question is now can we do better than that? And well, indeed, in, in, well, in this instance, we can. And this is this beautiful, really beautiful uh, insight of Bradley and Aldous. And what they saw, show is that you can generate random spanning tree using random walks by taking a random walk. Okay. So what's happening here is just you can get this random spanning tree by just uh, using the following simple algorithm. When you start a random walk at some vertex s. And then what you do is, well, you start this, this random walk starts visiting vertices in the graph. And then whenever you visit a new vertex v, you just add to your 3T the edge through this, is, this first visit occurring. Okay, so roughly, and then you know, in the end, once you have visited all the new edges, so you, once you covered uh, the whole graph with your random walk, then you just output the tree that you created from this first visit edges. Okay, so roughly speaking, the algorithm is like that. So let's say we start our random walk at S, and then here we visit this vertex over here. Clearly, this is the first visit, so we take the corresponding edges in. Then, you know, we have next first visit, we, we take the corresponding edge, and so on and so on. Here, we actually revisit the same vertex again, so we don't add an, uh, we don't add an edge, and then we again have first edge, and so on and so on, and we get we come up with some tree, okay? And you know, and this is the algorithm. And you know, why does it work? Well, it's magic. So next time. <laughs> okay, it's actually not really magic, but uh, the first time you see it, especially when it's written in the paper, it's really magical. Like there are just some formulas that miraculously come to, to be the right thing. But of course, there is a better answer than that. But again, I, uh, that's something that I'm happy to uh, to explain offline. Isn't it, uh, isn't it essentially the proof of Pythagorean? Yes, no, that's what I'm saying. That is not surprising. But you know, when you see the when you see the proof the way they did it, it's it's, it's, it's magic. It's also there is this proof by you know this copying from the past technique, and it's also it's, it's beautiful and it's magic. But only later you realize, oh, I was tricked. Like this is something to <laughs> be expected. But it's just you know this is really beautiful stuff. Okay, so this is so so it works actually magically. But how about the running time? Well, clearly, what you have to do, well, you have to simulate the, the walk until it it visits every vertex in the graph. So essentially, the running time of the algorithm is roughly you know the proportion of the cover time of the graph. And in the worst case, we know that the cover time of a graph is m n. Okay, so this is literally the the running time that we get. So it improves the m squared part from the previous slide. It does not does not necessarily improve the m to the omega part when the graph is 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 dense. Okay. Good. And actually, Wilson, he got a, a different random process that's sort of similar framework that actually gives you this uh, random spanning tree in uh, all of mean heating time. We'll not explain what it is, but it's something that in some graphs is smaller than cover. It's always bounded by cover time, but it's sometimes smaller than the cover time. But still, in the worst case, it's all of them. Okay? By the way, it's okay. It's me now, I've known this in many years, but what, what about the most obvious uh, thing? I mean, think of, of uh, this from the metroid perspective. You start with a tree, you add a, a, a random edge, this creates a cycle, you throw away a... Well, that's exactly sort of one way of, of getting this algorithm, right? Like you just exactly look at this back of back of chain, yeah. Yeah. and then you like, and then essentially. One, so this is this is the yes, like this is coming from the past. Like you essentially look at this process, where you you run it in the, the other like against the time, and then you just realize that yeah, after after uh, long enough time, you were able to reconstruct what was you know what is the new formula on this tree just by observing the transition. Now that's exactly the idea. Okay. Good. So you know, so we we have this off and then bounce, and the question is, you know, can we uh, can we improve upon that even well? And you know, so one instructive thing to do here is just to look at the back case. Okay, so when does this algorithm, this random walk based algorithm, perform badly? And probably all of you know what, what are the bad cases for that. It's so something called like well, I will call it totally pop like graph, which whose uh, cover time so we have a complete graph on like omega of n vertices, and then we have something like a path of length omega of n as well. And what is known is that the cover time of this graph is uh, cubic, right? This is omega, uh, 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 omega if you start cubic. The, Sorry? If you start the, the right one. Yes, of course. If you start over here, yes, yes, of course. That, that's an important thing. You can have, uh, you know, yes. two. Yes, but they are, of course. It, bump it, then you are. So, yeah, when you, okay, well, then let's say. Lost wherever you start. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like, let's define cover time as over, like, the worst case over start. But, but you are, uh, yeah, it's, it's much easier if you start from there. <laughs> okay, 
<laughs> so you know, so, so roughly what happens is that essentially when you observe all this, like once this work starts here, what will happen is that it will quite quickly uh, cover the whole, uh, the whole complete graph, but then it will take many attempts before it manages to push all the way through to the, to the, last, uh, to the last vertex of the, of the path, okay? So this is where this uh, n cube uh, cover time is coming from, but you know, so this is the, the sort of the bad news. But then when you look at it, you know, you observe something. So, you know, one thing that we know from that is that, you know, from the point of view of our algorithm, all we really need to know for every vertex is just the first bit edge. And since we cover the, the k n graph very fast, we will get this first, uh, first visit edges for all the vertices in, in the k n relatively fast. Okay? So, so that we already know how our random tree will look like in this graph. Somehow, then we have to pay a lot of time uh, well, just to make sure that we also figure out how it looks in this path-like. So it's not, it's not just a path, it's just a path-like graph, how, how it looks there. Okay? So once you make the observation, you realize you, you might come up with the following idea. Okay? So how about just doing the following? How about just like cutting this graph into halves and this, and this path? Okay? Or just actually cut it even more? And just like, essentially, you identify these pieces that have good cover time, you know, and uh, there are not too many of them, hopefully. And then, uh, and then you know, you just find, you just simulate a random walk in each of these, you know, each of the species, you know, you will get, ideally, you would like to get some trees, and then you splice these trees, and then you get, you know, and then you get a uh, random spanning tree display. The effort is fast because you don't have to, like, once you cover something, you don't have to, like, spend a lot of time there to, to just push out to other parts of the graph, okay? So this is an idea. Actually, this, in sense, this is a good idea, in, even though it doesn't work you know, the way you would like to, in, uh, to apply it more simplistically. Because the problem is that somehow, OK, so over there, there was a cut with just one edge, which is simple. But in general, this cut might be small, but not, uh, not with an edge. And then if you look at sort of the intersection of a given part of the graph with the random spanning tree, it might not always be a tree. Okay? It actually might be some forest, and then once you try to splice this random forest to make sure that they form a random, like a tree in the first place, and the random spanning tree, uh, uh, well, in general, this becomes very ugly and it doesn't really work. Okay? So, you know, so maybe the most simplistic idea doesn't work here, but we are onto something here, and actually there is a way of turning this observation into a general approach. So, roughly, so what you do, you indeed cut your graph, and you roughly cut, you, you, you just use essentially ball growing technique of latent route that John uh, had described, to cut your graph into pieces that have low diameter each and have small interface. So the number of edges between different pieces is small. Okay? And now what you do? Well, you again run the random walk in this whole graph, but do you do it in a smart way. Okay? So the smart way, what it corresponds to is that there is a certain shortcutting, a certain optimization in this. So namely, if in one of these pieces, you know, my work already discovered all the first visit edges, so I know already how my tree looks like, then, you know, whenever I am about to revisit the same piece again in my random walk, I actually don't do it. What I do instead is I shortcut it. So essentially, if I'm entering this cluster at some vertex Z, instead of simulating this random walk inside, which would be very wasteful, what I just do, I just immediately want to just choose uh, one, of the, like, one of the edges through which I will exit according to some appropriate shortcut distribution, and just, you know, and just immediately go there and continue my random walk. Okay, so essentially I don't want to spend time on revisiting pieces that I already fully explored. Okay? So, uh, essentially, uh, so essentially this is the idea, and notice that once doing that, like by shortcutting the random walk, we are not losing any information that we really need, because we still retain all the first, vi first visit edges. So essentially we are just cutting out some wasteful trajectories that do not make us learn anything about random spanning tree. And essentially, since we have, uh, like each of these pieces is low diameter, then it's covered relatively, uh, relatively, uh, relatively quickly. And since we have small interface, then the number of steps over, well, between different pieces is also not too big as well. Okay? So this is the basic idea, but of course there is a missing element. So one thing that, that we don't know how yet is just how to exactly do this shortcut. Right? We want to, uh, to enter and then immediately exit by one of the edges with appropriate probability. But how to compute this probability? So uh, we're roughly speaking you know, what it is that we want to do. So imagine that this is our cluster and this is the rest of the graph. And what we really want to do, we want to be able to compute the probability uh, PED of, you know, if I enter a vertex V to this cluster, what is the probability that among all the possible edges I would, through which I, would, uh, I could exit through, I will exit through this particular edge key. Okay? So, well, any ideas uh, how to compute it? 
electric off the Yes. <laughs> Great presentation. Yes, the, the funny thing is that we can just use electrical flows or Laplace solver to answer this question. So essentially, there is a there is a theorem that okay, was translated to the setting. What it says essentially, so what we do here is just we take these uh, outgoing edges and we just keep them. One of them goes to one vertex u star, and the one that we want to actually in, that we are interested in goes to the to the to the original vertex u. And now we have just the two vertices. And all you really need to know is that if I start a random walk at v, then uh, will I first, first hit u or will, will I uh, first hit u star? Okay, this is exactly corresponds to computing this probability. But now this kind of you know will I hit here first or here first probabilities? You can use electrical flows to to compute them. Namely, the theorem roughly says is that all I have to do is I have to impose a voltage of zero at u star, voltage of one at uh, at u, and then whatever voltages will settle on the rest of the vertices they will be exactly equal to these probabilities. Okay? So we can clearly like, check it that you know, at u is 1. So well, that, that's the, the right thing, because you immediately are in u, as opposed to hitting u star. At you start at 0. And then actually the beauty of, uh, of the connection between electrical flow and random walks is that you can prove that you know, for every vertex, whatever the voltage will be, it will be exactly the probability that our random walk at v will hit u before hitting u star, which corresponds to this probability. Do you actually fit this computation for HP? Yes, yes. So I have to uh, I, I, I have to I have to do that. So that's part of the running time analysis. And uh, you know, and again, the problem is that in principle, I you know, I, I need this computation to be exact. But actually, the, this, there's no definition by probe that says that actually good, sufficiently good approximation suffices. And you know, once you put it all together, which I will not do, but yes, this will include computing. You know, how many times you have to compute it for different edges. What you will get is you will get a you know, m times square root of n algorithm. Okay. Does, does that approximation need to be log of one over epsilon, or I mean, does it need to be really good? It needs to be really good. Yes, it needs to be like one over epsilon would not be sufficient. So it's like you need to handle something like one over squared, uh, one over n squared error. Okay. So this is uh, well. So this is the bound, and you know this is again for sparse graph. This is n to the three halves, and again it's actually. For the same reasons that other m to the have. So again, what is happening uh, inside there? There is some ball growing argument that is tight uh, and gives you n to the three <coughs> So the question, you know, can you actually break this n to the three barrier here? And indeed, uh, you can. This is a this is a recent work with uh, my, my, my undergrad students, I guess. That's that's how you say it. And roughly speaking, just this is just one, one slide. So what is the idea here? So first of all, you know, it's always when you want to break some barrier, it's good to look at some tough examples for the previous algorithm. And the tough example for the previous algorithm is just the following uh, graph, in which we have two expanders, okay, that are joined by roughly square root of n paths of square root of n length each. Okay? So the reason why this is a tough example for our previous algorithm is that this graph has you know n to the three halves cover time. So if I just want to simulate the work uh, as it is, it will be take n to the three halves uh, bound. But Unfortunately, there is no good way of cutting it into smaller pieces. It's like we can't really, like, if we should try to apply the ball growing, it will not give us anything interesting. It will exactly hit this trade-off that gives us n to the three halves. So roughly, there is not, it's not clear what to do, uh, what to do with this kind of graph. Okay. And here are like, essentially, our our new algorithm is just based on just three insights that I think are more important than the algorithm itself. So one thing that you know, like, there are three elements that we need to overcome this kind of problems. So one thing that is, I think, most important is that actually. In this, uh, it, well, to overcome it, you actually have to look at the right metric for the problem. Okay, so instead of looking at the graph distance metric, so we are looking at the low diameter, low diameter pieces. What you want to look is actually want to look at the effective resistance metric that's induced by like there is this embedding that Nikhil was talking about that you can embed your vertices, uh, vertices uh, of the graph into into L two or L two squared actually, and then you know distance like the effective resistance distance will be approximate actually it's low, low, low dimensional. And then the effective resistance distance between two points is exactly you can just compute by, by looking at the L2 squared normal. Okay, so instead of looking at the graph distance metric in our partitionings, we look at the right metric here, which is the effective resistance metric. And the funny thing that happens then is that, for instance, even though in the graph distance metric these two expanders are far, when you look at the effective resistance metric, they're actually very close to each other. Okay, so that's, that's the surprising thing. And so in a sense, even though you know, they don't look like this on this picture, they actually, these two graphs together, they form a region of low effective resistance diameter, okay? which is a, a desirable thing for us. And then what you do, well, then actually once you are able to identify 
big regions of small effective distance radius, then what you do, you just sample your tree in, you sample your tree in phases. So essentially, whenever you identify such region, you discover what is the, how does random spanning tree look like in this region, then you condition in an appropriate way and you recurse. Okay? And just the last missing piece is that you have to say, okay, if I have, like you have to say that if you have two regions that are big and are not close to each other in effective distance metric, then you, have do, you can do something, and indeed you can prove, like, it's some I don't know, analog of Shigeru's inequality. You can show that if you have two regions that are far away in effective distance metric, there has to be a good cut between them. So then you can do cutting and, uh, and just sort of apply the strategy from the, from the previous algorithm. Okay, so sort of like, so for half cases, you can, this new optics allows you to just, uh, to just uh, create this tree in, in stages, and if this uh, new optics is, does not help, it means that actually there is a better cut, and you can find it. Okay. Can you just use the fact that uh, if factor is, is L1 embeddable? Because I would need to think about it. So uh, yeah, like I'm, ha I'm happy to discuss. I'm running over that, but I, that's interesting for you. So I have to I have to parse. Alex, could you say again what does the graph look like in the uh, in the federal system uh, embedding? Does it look like the lollipop graph? It looks like something like. Like something like that. It's like these paths are pretty far from these expanders, but these two expanders are close. Right? Like, just, like just, just thinking like so effective distance corresponds roughly to the to the uh, commute time between uh, between this well between two points. So the funny thing is that all these paths they facilitate like there are long, but there's many of them. So that so you, you can always like sort of count that on one of them getting you from one side to the other. But you know the path itself actually are pretty far from when you ins insist that I want to go from here to here, then this actually will take much longer time. And then will So if that makes any sense. So so it's still the whole graph has uh, effective resistance uh, diameter being omega of square root of n, but you know these expanders are actually close. It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense because the commute time. I mean, the commute time gets better because you add more edges. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the process of going. You still have to walk along a path to get. Yes, but you can return by by, by a different path and so on, right? So. Okay. So okay. So that's uh, that's essentially uh, roughly. So once you put all the math together, what you get is n to the four thirds time. Okay, it's still not linear, but well, we are getting better. And yeah, that's all I wanted to say. No problem. But uh, let me just. Quick question. Yeah. So does it work for sampling k forests? No, forests have a very different structure. I don't think that anything works for forests. Like uh -huh. forests because they have the same uh, determinantal process, right? Yes, no, but okay. Like at some point, I thought about this and I realized that this is like like there are similarities, but some of the crucial are missing. I don't remember which one are these. We can talk offline and maybe I will recall. Like I thought about it because I tried to make it work. Where just if you were able to indeed just you know cut it into pieces and, and splice everything nicely, you would get a very fast algorithm immediately. Yeah. There were some, I, you know, it was a couple of years ago, so I didn't remember which is the problem, but there were problems. Like, these problems are like, forests are <coughs> significantly harder to tackle than, than trees. Okay? So, uh, just, uh, just wrap up. So, what happens in the talk, I just showed you uh, two examples when electrical flow ended up to be a key algorithmic primitive. Okay? So, I just, uh, I just made the algorithmic in bold because the point is that, you know, it's not as a electrical flow, like we, have, we know a lot about electrical flows, the connection to the structure of the graph. But now we really lose them as an algorithmic tool. Yes, we want to compute something. An electrical flow, computing electrical flow is a mean to this end for us. Okay? So that I think what is important to uh, well, take away from this talk. And of course, there is not, this is not the only examples when electrical flows computation were very useful algorithmic primitive. And, you know, and even more importantly, I think this is just the beginning. There will be much more uh, of this kind of uh, applications of electrical flows as a, as, as a graph algorithmic primitive. And again, I just want to highlight that you know, to make this uh, application successful, we always had to use this theme of merging continuous and covectoral perspective. Okay? So for in, in random spanning trees, we had to find these partitions, because without them, we couldn't make our algorithms fast enough. In, in electrical flow, well, we have to use uh, well, the whole, okay, in both cases, we have to use the power of solvers, which already play on this, on this connection uh, quite a lot to be efficient. And again, in each case, it really was important that you know, we, we use tools from more perspective and sort of and, uh, combine them together to get a fast algorithm. If we just stick to one side, well, we just don't get, any, uh, we just don't get far. So I just want you to keep in mind. And I just, a small remark is that in this picture, I put, you know, this is linear algebra, this is combinatorial algorithms, and then I put this optimization. We have not seen much of it today. 
but this we will see a lot of it in the in the in the, in the remaining two lectures. Actually, a lot of it. Okay. And again, uh, as I said, max flow is just an example, and you know the ultimate goal behind it is actually just get a new next generation of tools for graph algorithm in general. But max flow is a nice example, but it's only one problem. And in particular, the nice thing of tools that are that we get via this route is that. Well, first of all, they are capable of making progress on things that we couldn't make progress. That's one good thing about, uh, about these tools. But the other thing is that actually their nature and so on, their the close ties to the optimization show that they are very robust. In, a sense, in particular, you know, w w one nice thing that, uh, about them is that often they allow you to give, you know, depending on what is your time budget, they allow you to get some decent answer. It might be not exact answer, but it might be approximate. Like you can trade off approximation versus running time. And this is something very desirable, for instance, if you want to deal with big graphs and so on, where you, know, you can't afford too much of time, so you want to do the best you can with the, you know, with the resources you have. Okay? And that's all I want to say. Do you conjecture that the uh, random spanning tree should have the same kind of time as undirected back and flow? I conjecture that it should be new linear time, which is the same I conjecture from the other flow because well, I don't have to conjecture that it's true. Yes. I think that it's again it's there is I see no reason why it shouldn't be new linear time. There are some stupid technical reasons, but they are just they seem to be not fundamental in any way. Like in the end, you know, if you look what happened for for an like max flow is that we, we found the right you know projection like essentially we had enough of insight from computerial side of the things to, to speed up the linear algebraic things. And I think that the same is happening here. So already now moving to this uh, like effective resistance based metric, like in a sense, it a bit reminds me of preconditioning and all this stuff. So we are sort of using partitions in the right metrics now. Now we just have to get better partitions and hopefully things will just, then we will, we will get the linear time. I really think that, you know, just we are lacking on the computer understanding of the, of the problem now, but not the linear time. But yeah, I think it should be really the thing. Yes. What do you think is the complexity of computing a random operations in a uh, directed graph? Yeah, this might be hard. Uh, I I think that uh, yeah, I I have no good intuitions. Like I thought a little bit about this and I couldn't come up with much. Like directed graphs, like in that case, directed graphs really like it's not like if Max Flow and say directed graphs you know, are are the same as an directed as long as you solve this thing. Uh, Think uh, exactly. In algorithms, it's like most of these techniques, they just don't work. It's like you, 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 like it's not clear there what would be the combinatorial part because the partitions in the in, in the directed graph they don't look nice. So like I, do, you know, I think it's like n squared now or something like this, like the M N, and I don't like I want to hope that you can do better, but I don't have good reasons to believe that you can do better. Like this is this is the regime I don't understand. How to, how to, how to. Thank you.